From the Victory Studios in downtown Little Rock, this is Capital View with your host, Roby Brock and David Goins. And good Sunday morning to you. Welcome into Capital View. I'm David Goins. And I'm Roby Brock. It's our first show of 2014. There's plenty to get to. Later this half hour, Matt Campbell, blogger and creator of the Blue Hog Report, joins us, as well as radio talk show host Alice Stewart. They're here for our political long table. Plenty to get to, but first a scan of the headlines and newsmakers for the week. And we begin where else with our soon to be former lieutenant governor right. sensing no way around being impeached. Mark Dar resigned late Friday, effective February 1st. The move avoiding what would, would have been a likely protracted removal process in both the House and Senate. Dar issuing his resignation via a statement from his office saying in part, I submit that resignation to the people of Arkansas not an elected official. Politics can be a toxic business. I will no longer subject my family to its hard lessons. Now, before deciding to resign, Dar said he was putting stakes in the ground to fight for the people of Arkansas. Mm -hmm. That was on Tuesday. And then he said he wanted to get the factual truth regarding his ethics problems out there. We start with a look back at Dar with his most recent television interview again on Tuesday at the Lieutenant Governor's office. These are the facts as I see them, and I think that those are important for the public to know. In a prepared statement, Mark Dar says mistakes in campaign reporting, errors in travel reimbursements, and using a state credit card for personal purchases were not intentional, and that he has no plans to resign yet. And as soon as I feel that it's in the best interest for me and my family to make that decision, then me and my family will make it, but it won't be under fear or intimidation by another person. The State Ethics Commission fined Dar $11,000 last week for 11 separate violations of state law, a penalty Dar accepted. I think it's in everybody's best interest, including uh, Mr. Dar, if he resigned. Calls for his resignation quickly followed from the governor and to Republicans like Congressman Tim Griffin and Senator John Bozeman. I believe that people who ask for my resignation are either acting politically they are either ignorant of the facts or they're making emotional response. So you think the majority of people who have asked for your resignation are doing it for political reasons? Uh, I mean, sitting here today, to be honest with you, if my opinion, absolutely. Even within your own party? Uh, I believe they fall into those uh, three areas that I said to you earlier. Now increased calls for possible impeachment if Dar is still in office once the Senate reconvenes next month. Dar says he'll deal with that reality when and if it arrives. And I think state representatives and state senators are, uh, ought to be pretty careful that they set um, uh, a precedent for what is impeachable and what's not. Uh, because I think that that could open uh, Pandora's box for, for maybe them or some of their friends. And that box staying closed with Dar stepping aside. But throughout this process, Lieutenant Governor said, Although he made mistakes and admitted violating state law, he seemed to firmly believe political enemies were trying to take him down. Take a look at an excerpt from my interview where Dar expounds further on the Ethics Commission and what he calls the truth. The Ethics Commission is, is not the media sources or, or the person with, with the phone that, that, that thinks that they're media that, that pushes things out. The, our side of the story has not been told, and today is my time to do that. I'm going to ask that again. You talk about the truth. Is what the Ethics Commission found not the truth? Uh, no, it is the truth. I don't agree with 100% how they worded things, but I'm not going to fight with them over that. It's not worth that. Uh, I respect the Ethics Commission. I respect the commissioners and their work. They, they're doing the best that they can, too. Uh, but at the end of the day, I have to do what I feel is right for, this, for me, my family, and the citizens of Arkansas. And as the week progressed, the pressure continued to mount. Many of those closest to Dar indicating it was likely to need to step aside. As far as Governor Beebe's concerned, his statement never really changed after calling for Dar's resignation on New Year's Eve. But when I did ask him his assessment of the Dar situation's effect on the state on Wednesday, he opened up. Well, it's not healthy. I don't think anybody's happy about it uh, on, on any side of the equation. I think everybody uh, is saddened by it all regardless of uh, what their position is. And Dar stepping down avoids what would have been the first impeachment in the 140 years of Arkansas's current constitution. Now the problems for the lieutenant governor certainly didn't form overnight, but they manifested quickly over the last three weeks after a legislative audit found Dar misspent taxpayer and campaign funds. The state ethics commission asked Dar to appear December 18th. 
The commission found DAR violated 11 separate state statutes with a total tab of over $40,000, most of it in campaign money. DAR did not answer any questions from reporters after leaving that hearing. Weeks later, he told reporters he wasn't asked any questions either from the Ethics Commission. Then on December 30th, he accepted an $11,000 fine, the largest ever from the Ethics Commission. And if lawmakers resigning from office is your litmus for a healthy legislative environment, certainly not a banner year and a half or so in Arkansas. Dar joining a trio of Democrats who stepped aside amid various scandals. Former State Representative Hudson Hallam pled guilty in federal court back in September of 2012 to paying for votes, offering cash, fried chicken and vodka to get him to Little Rock. State Treasurer Martha Schaffner arrested at her Newport home one Saturday in May by the FBI as part of a pay to play scheme, admitting to accepting cash and pie boxes from a bond investor. But Schaffner denied doing so in exchange for state investments and a federal jury will decide the particulars of that later in March. And after receiving a $4,000 fine from the State Ethics Commission, former State Senator Paul Bookout vacated his Northeast Arkansas Senate seat last August. And there were other items in the news this week. State lawmakers once again hearing testimony this week from former and current University of Arkansas officials about the $4 million deficit in the school's advancement division. Leaders testified before the Legislative Joint Performance Review Committee. The hearing was to address overspending in the university's fundraising department. Employees fired as a result of the deficit testified. They mainly defended their roles in the debacle. And on Thursday, lawmakers discussing possible state law changes allowing Arkansas school employees to carry guns on campus. Right now, 13 districts in the state have employees authorized to carry weapons on campus. State Senator Jeremy Hutchinson of Little Rock says he wants to change the way those employees are licensed, allowing state police to make those decisions and dissolving the State Board of Private Investigators. Hutchinson says he'll push to add more armed staff to schools when the fiscal session starts in February. And Attorney General Dustin McDaniel says it's embarrassing his office didn't realize a new state law would have a major unintended consequence. Voters are supposed to decide on three constitutional amendments in November, but a change made during the 2013 session takes away the AG's ability to name each proposal. And without a name, they cannot appear on the ballot. Now, no solution came from the meeting on Monday, so they'll do it again on the 23rd. Lawmakers, the AG, and Secretary of State all say they want a solution, so you know what you're voting on when you go to the polls later this year. Families crowded the state capitol this week to testify on behalf of their loved ones in human development centers. The facilities provide care for severely mentally and de developmentally disabled individuals. In recent years, the U.S. Department of Justice has fought to close the facilities, saying people living there would be better served in a, in a more community-based living condition. The state and many families today say they disagree. I'm sure there's people out there, because I know some of them, who think they are institutions, prisons. They're not. Is a human development center really a restricted environment? No, it's the least restrictive environment for the population that lives there. Legislators say they need to find a way to increase funding for the five human development centers statewide or risk seeing more people living there sent to other facilities. Well, no doubt a very busy week and a very kind of busy end to the week uh, with what happened on Friday night. Uh, coming up after a quick break, a man whose inquiries brought the DAR ethics issue to light, Matt Campbell, will join us along with radio host Alice Stewart. I'm David Goins. Alongside Roby Brock, you're watching Capital View on Sunday morning on KARK.